Hello, I'm Ed Fuquay, young adult librarian extraordinaire here at Woonsocket Harris Public Library. Solitaire Frisbee from the children's room. And we're here to talk more about King Arthur. Now, last time I talked mostly about the historical King Arthur and where the legend comes from. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's basically fanfic. It mm -hmm. was pieced together of a lot of different writers across a stretch of like hundreds of years, reflecting very different viewpoints and worldviews. And since then, the story of Arthur and his, his, the Round Table has been reinterpreted by various modern writers in numerous different ways. But we can come up with a, like a follow through of the basic legend. So we're going to talk about the legend. Um, a legend that probably never happened, uh, but just because, as we've learned, you know, through all of the mythology we've been studying, just because something never happened doesn't mean it isn't important. So, this is the legend of King Arthur, and I'll come with like warnings. It comes with warnings, rather. So it's a tale of murder, adultery, rape, and incest. <laughs> all the things that make medieval romance worth reading. Here, here. All right. So our story begins back in the Dark Ages. Um, England, or the country that is going to be called England, is in a time of turmoil. There's war everywhere. There's no central government. Barbarians are attacking from the east and the west, uh, pitting which chaos, destruction. Um, one of the many warlords vying for power is a man named Uther Pendragon. A really great name. Now, Uther is a cunning and ruthless warlord, but the big advantage that he has is he has an advisor called Merlin, who is a magician. Now, Merlin comes to us from Welsh mythology. He was originally a bard. Um, and Merlin seemingly has a plan, a plan that will take more than a generation to come to fruition. Um, a, a tricky, cunning plan um, to save England or possibly to create England um, or possibly to allow pagan thought to survive into the Christian era, depending on how you interpret his actions. Um, Merlin always has an ulterior motive for everything that he does. So, Uther is meeting with the Duke of Cornwall, who has an extremely attractive wife, Egraine. And Uther wants her, wants her badly. And says to Merlin, you know, I have to be with her, set it up, and I'll give you anything that you want. Now, instead of blowing him off like a smart wizard would do, Merlin agrees to this plan. He says, but, you know, I will arrange for this to happen, but you have to give me the result of this night. And Uther is fine with that. So Merlin casts a spell to make Uther look exactly like the Duke of Cornwall. So while the armies are fighting out in the field, um, Uther comes back in looking exactly like the Duke. And he has relations with his wife, or with the Duke's wife. Um, in uh, the movie version Excalibur by John Borman, which I highly recommend if you're over the age of 18. Um, uh, little Morgan, who was like six years old at the time, um, watches the whole thing happen. And with her second sight, she already knows that it isn't really her father. And that sets up her lifelong enmity towards the Pendragon clan and everything that they stand for. Um, so uh, Uther goes on to defeat the Duke, kill him in battle, and take over Cornwall. He then marries Egraine, who, guess what, is pregnant. And when the baby is born, Merlin dutifully arrives and takes the child away. <laughs> so Uther becomes a powerful king, restores a sense of stability to the land. He doesn't conquer all of England, but he makes a really good start. Um, however, he dies not too long after that. So meanwhile, Merlin has taken the baby away, whom he dubs Arthur to be raised in secret. Now, in T.H. White's version, it makes a big deal about um, uh, Merlin teaching him magic and how spells work and things like that. Um, but the, the most agreed upon version is that Arthur grows up basically as a servant. He becomes a page to Sir Kay, mm -hmm. who embarrassingly would later go on to become one of the knights that serves him. Um, and a page, a page does all the, the crappy work that a knight needs to have done, polishing the armor and you know that kind of thing. Um, so the fact that he was raised as a servant is an important part of his story because medieval romance is believed very much that blood will out. He is born to be king. He has noble blood flowing through his veins. So even as a servant, he displays the, the, that n those noble qualities that are absolutely unmistakable. Um, his destiny is assured, even though he appears to be in an extremely like modest position at that time. Um, now, after the death of Uther, um, Merlin took a magic sword and drove it into a rock and said, whoever pulls this sword out will be the next king. 
So hundreds of people tried from all over England, and none could succeed. Um, but wouldn't you know it, when Sir Kay was short a sword for a jousting match, and Arthur had to go out and grab a sword for him from anywhere, he just grabbed the first sword that he saw, the one sticking conveniently right out of this rock. So he pulls out the sword and goes running away, and suddenly, like, everybody freezes in position and starts kneeling to him, um, and someone proclaims, Behold, the next king of England! Um, yes, it's Arthur, because only Arthur could pull the sword from the stone. Now, the sword is technically Clarant. Um, it is not his most famous sword. It's his second most famous sword. Um, a Clarant is the sword of peace. It is the sword of state. Clarant is the sword that made Arthur the King of England. He'll continue to keep it for most of his reign. Uh, he uses Clarant for knighting people and things like that. He carries Clarant at all the official celebrations and so forth. Um, and just pulling that sword out makes him King of England. Uh, in most versions of the story, he's around 15 when this happens. Which was an age you were considered an adult in the Middle Ages, but it's also really young, particularly to have guys twice your age kneeling and swearing fealty to you. Um, needless to say, a lot of people are not happy with Arthur becoming king, and there's still a bunch of other warlords that Uther never got around to defeating, so right away Arthur is embroiled in war. Now, Merlin shows up to become his advisor just as he was his father's advisor, and hopefully he'll give Arthur better advice than he gave Uther. Um, so it became obvious that Arthur was being overwhelmed by his responsibilities and the numerous battles he was getting into. Only one thing could save him and preserve Merlin's plan. He needed a better sword. So, drawing upon his magical powers, Merlin arranged for the Lady of the Lake to give a sword to King Arthur, and that was the sword Excalibur. Excalibur was a war sword. Excalibur was unbeatable in battle. So long as he carried Excalibur, he basically couldn't be beaten in single combat. And it was Excalibur that allowed him uh, his many victories. And so very shortly, one by one, the other powers that be were swearing fealty to him. He drove out the Saxons, technically. Um, since England is still considered an Anglo-Saxon country, he may not have gotten all of them, but we'll say he drove out the Saxons. Um, he, he, he brought peace to the land, and he had a magnificent like, kingdom built, which was Camelot, this huge turreted castle. Um, he has an arranged marriage with Guinevere. Guinevere was a princess, so this was the marriage of state. In every version of the story, they do fall in love, even though in most versions they don't actually meet each other until like immediately before the wedding. But it's considered to be a good match. Now, Guinevere, unfortunately, like so many women in stories told by men, doesn't play that big a part, even though she's absolutely crucial to what happens. She's very beautiful, um, she's very witty, um, but aside from that, she doesn't exist too much as a character. Her existence in the story is mostly so she can interact with the men in the story. Um, uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley gave her a voice in Mists of Avalon, but unfortunately she also put her as a Christian in opposition to the pagan elements that were supporting Arthur. So she doesn't come across very well on that, even though she finally has like something to do. So Camelot exists, Arthur is king. Um, he establishes the code of chivalry which is what Arthur is most famous for. This was the age of knights in shining armor. Um, chivalry was um, a code of conduct for the ideal knight. This is how you were supposed to act. If you were, if you were born to nobility, you're expected to act this way all the time. It involves courage, honor, courtesy. You had to be polite. Um, you should always seek justice. And women were constantly put on a pedestal. Women were to be adored and worshiped um, it, you know, it's obvious that many women don't want to be put on a pedestal, and adoring and worshiping women isn't the same as respecting them. Right. Yeah. Um, so but once it's established, though, this gives the rules that everybody has to live by. And these are good rules. Um, knights gather from all over the world. Um, if I were to gather all the list of their names, there were hundreds of them. Wow. As I said, many of them come from their own cycle of stories that were later put into King Arthur's story. If I'm in the Middle Ages and I wanted to write a story about my own knight, I would say, you know, one day Sir, Sir Edward came from the court of King Arthur and did this and this and this. Then I go and tell a story that has nothing to do with King Arthur. Mm -hmm. Arthur only appears as a secondary character in most of these knights' own stories. Um, one of the ones who arrives is Parsifal, who had started a whole cycle of stories in which he tried to capture this magic thing called the Grail and failed. 
but he shows up at King Arthur's court. It'll become important later. Um, like I said, knights came from all over the world. Um, they weren't all uh, they weren't all white. There is a knight from North Africa who came. Um, in some versions of the story, there's actually a woman knight. She masquerades as a man. She's not in every version though, so she wasn't that popular a character. Um, and eventually, who should show up but his half sister Morgan, who's now not called Morgan anymore. Now she's Morgan Le Fay. It turned out that that nunnery that Uther sent her to was actually a school of pagan magic, and she's come back as an extremely powerful sorceress. Now Morgan Le Fay is a, is a fascinating character. I just adore her. Um, she's different in almost every interpretation of the story that you find. Um, she is mostly the enemy, the antagonist of Arthur. Whether she's a noble enemy or a vicious, scheming, backstabbing, murderous, we don't know. Depends on who interprets her story. Um, she's the champion of the pagan way of life, according to Marion Zimmer Bradley. Um, she definitely like undercuts the simple nature of King Arthur's court, where everything is always black and white, you never, and nothing ever goes wrong. Um, her very existence points up to the original sin that led to Arthur's birth in the first place. Um, which Arthur might not even know about. Um, Merlin could be very parsimonious with the truth sometimes. <laughs> so it's entirely possible that Morgan knew exactly how Arthur was born and Arthur himself didn't know. <laughs> so she arrives and she's basically trouble. She's the bad girl of the story. Now also arriving in Camelot is Lancelot. Lancelot du Lac. Um, the Lady of the Lake, who gave Arthur the sword, is his godmother, who, who helped raise him. Um, uh, Lancelot is the son of Elaine, who was the daughter of the Fisher King. Fisher King being one of the main characters in another whole cycle of stories surrounding the Grail. Oh. So Lancelot arrives as a Grail Knight. He's not the Grail Knight, he hasn't arrived yet. Um, so right away, Arthur's story is being interwoven with the Grail, which will become the Holy Grail when we get to the High Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, so knights are arriving from everywhere. Um, Lancelot and Guinevere see each other, and it's love at first sight, um, at least for on Lancelot's part. Now, I th mentioned last week a little bit about um, courtly romance and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, for Lancelot, falling in love with his best friend's wife, because he and Arthur were very close, um, it was okay, because um, it, it was a pure love, untainted by that sort of thing. Um, as to how pure it was, we really didn't know, because eventually in every version of the story, Guinevere and Lancelot sleep with each other. Hmm. And as I said, this is, story is always told from the male point of view. How Guinevere felt about all this, we really don't know. Did she love Lancelot? Um, did she love Arthur more? You know, um, it was a very dicey situation. Um, in Western society, when a man is cuckolded by his wife, that's considered to be a very, very bad thing. Um, adultery was one of the big sins that was unforgivable in the Middle Ages. Uh, so for Arthur to have this happen to him, it's as if he's lost his right to be king because he can't keep his wife in check. A man who can't even control his own wife, how can he control a kingdom? So just the fact that Lancelot exists is a problem for Arthur. But he's also his mightiest knight. Lancelot can just do everything well. Um, so the situation becomes slightly untenable. Um, in modern day terms, if Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot had sat down and worked out the terms of a polyamorous threesome, maybe Camelot wouldn't have fallen. Maybe the whole course of Western civilization could have been different. But that wasn't the choice that they, they went with. <laughs> They went with burn it all down instead. Um, and helping burn it all down, another arrival at court is Mordred. Young, sassy Mordred. Uh, Mordred is sometimes the uh, son of Morgan Le Fay, sometimes the son of her sister Morgis. And some of them, uh, Morgan has several relatives that pop up. Um, in any event, like Morgan, he plays the role of the spoiler who comes in to destroy everything. Now, in the most popular version of the story, Morgan, to get back at Arthur for uh, the various sins that his father committed, seduces him. 
and gets with child from that. She always uses a spell because Arthur is so in love with Guinevere um, that Morgan has to use a spell, which she does. Um, and she has a child who grows up to become Mordred. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, by this time, you may notice that Merlin isn't around anymore. Because, like all mentors, Merlin has to vanish when the going gets tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he pulls a real Obi-Wan Kenobi and disappears from the storyline, literally, right at the time Arthur needs him the most. When he could really use some wise, sage advice by the wisest mystic in the land, there's no Merlin. The reason for that is uh, he was lured away from Arthur's court uh, by Nimue, usually. Sometimes it's Vivian, sometimes it's the Lady of the Lake. We'll go with Nimue. Nimue is often his student, whom he taught magic to, who uses everything that she's learned to capture him and destroy him. Uh, sometimes um, she loves him and she does it to save him from the disaster that's coming. There are versions in which Nimue is really sympathetic. Um, and there's also a version of it, I think, that T.H. White went with, that Merlin had foreknowledge of the future. And at one point, when he, he actually tells Arthur, well, I have to go away, you know, forever now. And Arthur's like, what? You can't do that. He's like, well, it's one of those things I have to do. He literally can't break the cycle of prophecy, even though his presence, of course, would have altered everything. Mm. So he doesn't have his wisest advisor, doesn't have his magical protection. Uh, the Camelot is starting to get really unshaky, uh, starting to get shaky politically. Um, so meanwhile, um, Another knight arrives, and this is Sir Galahad. Um, Galahad is like the best knight in the world. He outdoes Lancelot in everything. Um, he's literally unbeatable in battle by anyone. He can fight like with his eyes closed and one arm behind his back, you know, that kind of thing. He's ridiculously good. He's the Mary Sue of the plot. In fact, at the round table, they have a chair that no one sits in. It's known as the Siege Perilous. And if you sit in there and you're not the true Grail Knight, you will die instantly. And so when he wanders in, um, Galahad, without thinking, just plops down in the chair. Everybody goes, <gasps> he's not dead. So from that moment, they know he is predestined to find the Grail. Which shouldn't surprise them later when it happens, and yet strangely it does. Um, so I've talked about the Holy Grail quite a bit. So we should start describe what that is. Uh, the bottom line is no one really knows. Um, the word that we say as grail probably means serving plate or dinner plate, um, although it's always described as a cup in most of Western literature. So we'll say it's a cup for, my, for our purposes. Now, um, this was the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. So right away it has so the most important things in Christendom is the cup that Jesus drank wine from, that he held in his hand in the last night before the Romans came for him. And one of his followers, Joseph of Arimathea, um, takes the cup. It was at Joseph's house that the, that the supper occurred. Um, it was Passover. Uh, so he takes the cup, and uh, when Jesus is crucified, he uses the cup to gather Jesus' blood. Mm -hmm. Kind of icky, but, you know, they did things like that in those days. Uh, he got in trouble with the Roman authorities, not surprising. He's locked up at one, in one, some versions of the story. But he has the grail with him, which sustains him so he survives without food or drink for a couple of years. The Romans finally forget about him and let him go. So he takes the grail with him, this precious holy object, and he flees the Holy Land and gets on a boat and sails all the way to England, which had been conquered by the Romans at this time, so it's not that difficult a journey. Which is why in many versions of the story, the Holy Grail is found in England. because That's where Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea took it. Um, and then Joseph of Arimathea vanishes from history. In fact, he vanishes so much from history, he probably never really existed. Um, there was a follower of Jesus named Joseph who came from Arimathea, and aside from that, he doesn't really appear in the Bible. He wasn't, didn't appear in anything until the high Middle Ages. So right away, the whole story is kind of spurious. But this is the Holy Grail that Jesus drank from. It is the most powerful, most potent symbol in all of Christendom, um, and no one knows where it is. Um, or, as uh, Monty Python put it in Spam a lot, uh, God, the Almighty and All-Knowing, has misplaced a cup. <laughs> so God asks Arthur and his knights to find the Grail. And this is no longer just the Grail that Parsifal wanted, it is the Holy Grail, the most important and powerful thing in the universe. It is the Holy Grail. So Arthur, in some versions, Arthur sees 
things are not going so well for him, so he believes that finding the grail will redeem him, will make his sins go away, will wash him clean. Because whoever finds the grail is purified by it. So anything that you've done wrong will be gotten rid of once you have the grail. Which is why it's so important to find it, bring it back to Camelot and heal everything that's wrong. Um, unfortunately, what this means is that Arthur sends away his best knights, and in some versions of the story, Arthur himself leaves Camelot to go find the Holy Grail. So right at a time when Camelot is on shaky ground, Arthur goes to find the Holy Grail. Hmm. Um, the journey, for the most part, does not go well. Um, the knights are completely failed to find the Holy Grail, which is not surprising since they already know that only Galahad could find the Holy Grail. Um, so needless to say, they all fail one by one. Uh, during the course of the journey, at some point, um, Arthur discovers that Lancelot and Guinevere are an item. In one version of the story, he stops by uh, Morgan Le Fay's castle to grab a bite, and she greets him very courteously. And um, when he goes to bed, he discovers that there is a big drawing of Lancelot and Guinevere in flagretto on the wall. And he's like, what is this? And Morgan says, oh, I forgot. I kidnapped Lancelot and held him here at my mercy for a while. Um, tried to seduce him, failed. What a guy. But while he was chained up here, he made this picture of himself and Guinevere to remind him of how much he loved her. I totally forgot it was in your room, Arthur. Sorry, bro. So, <laughs> wow. so Arthur goes back to Camelot, feeling an even worse mood than when he left out looking for the Holy Grail. Because he can't pretend it didn't happen. He can't go back to his wife anymore. He can't accept Lancelot back into court. Um, uh, Lancelot doesn't get arrested for the charges. He escapes custody. Um, adultery is against the law. Uh, in the f musical uh, Camelot, um, Guinevere is sentenced to be burned at the stake. But Arthur arranges for it to happen in a way that Lancelot can and does rescue her. Um, so while this is going on, Galahad, of course, finds the Holy Grail. But wouldn't you know it, as soon as he touches the Holy Grail, heaven opens up and angels come down and lift him bodily to heaven. So the rest of the knights are all going, um, Galahad, we, Grail, we, and yeah. he's like, bye guys, heaven. <laughs> so he rises up to heaven. The rest of the knights are all sitting there going, oh, yeah, that didn't work out the way we planned. So all the knights have to ride back with no grail in tow, nor any hope of ever finding a grail because it is now literally in heaven. Uh, so they arrive back, Arthur's best knights, at a time when uh, it is split by civil war. Uh, Mordred has come back. Uh, Mordred has stolen Clarant, the Sword of Peace. So he has a magic sword of his own. Arthur still has Camelot. Um, in some versions, Arthur has a magic scabbard that prevents him from losing blood after he's stabbed, and Mordred steals that too. Mm. Mordred is leading either a bunch of disaffected knights who no longer serve Arthur, or a bunch of barbarians who want to conquer Camelot for their own reasons. Possibly both. Anyway, he's laying siege to Camelot. Um, Arthur's disheartened knights don't put up that good a battle. Um, he's lost Lancelot, he's lost Guinevere who goes and becomes a nun in most versions of the story, out, out of shame for what she's done. Um, no Merlin. Um, so he faces basically the end of everything. Everything that he has done is literally about to be torn down. <laughs> and there's nothing he can do about it. Merlin's not there, but I think at this point, Arthur can see the handwriting on the wall that whatever Merlin planned just didn't work out in the long run. Mm. Um, so, and he it worries him, of course, that with the death of Cam with the death, death of himself and the ruination of Camelot, what will happen to the age of chivalry? What will happen to honor and justice and fair play and all that stuff that Arthur's tried to instill in people? Mm -hmm. um, was it ever worth trying to do the right thing? You know, the musical Camelot has a very moving scene where Arthur has to pass on to a, a page. He was forbidden to join the battle. You have to go. <laughs> Spread it far and wide, tell the story so it will not be forgot. But once there was a place called Camelot. Um, so he goes into battle against Mordred. They each have magic swords. Um, they kill each other, <laughs> sometimes simultaneously. <laughs> um, and Arthur summons one of his surviving knights and hands him Excalibur and says to return it to the lake. Where the Lady of the Lake is, of course, waiting for him, waiting for the sword, as she always is. 
and there's a whole in Howard Pyle's version there's a whole rigmarole he refuses to get rid of the sword <laughs> and Arthur on his deathbed you know okay seriously get rid of the sword <laughs> eventually he hurls it back in the lake and she catches it and takes it under the waves until it's needed again of course mm -hmm. um, because Excalibur like Arthur himself will come back when Britain needs him um, that's why T.H. White called his version of the story the once and future king whereas Malvin called his version the death of Arthur so <laughs> Our attitudes towards Arthur have somewhat changed since Mallory's time. Um, after the sword disappears, Arthur, as he's dying, sees this barge coming across the water, and there are four magical women on it, one of whom is Morgan, his half-sister. Mm -hmm. In every version of the story, even the ones in which Morgan is pure evil, she's one of the priestesses who takes him back to Avalon, always. He goes back to Avalon, the Isle of Apples, where he'll be blessed and gradually heal over the course of, of centuries and come back when England needs him again. I mean, that's that's rough in terms of, of Morgan's perspective. Yeah. I mean, she, I'm sure, was torn between it. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. You know? It's um, not his fault what his father did. Right. But everything he did in his whole life capitalized on his father's sins. Um, but unknowingly so. Unknowingly so, yeah. Um, because of the, it's, it's a very pagan story, but it also has that veneer of Christianity sort of like still act onto it. Um, that's why the adultery of Lancelot and Guinevere is so very important. It is literally a sin that destroys Camelot. Mm -hmm. The dissolution of Arthur's marriage means that he can't be king anymore and Camelot has to fall, mm -hmm. um, which is not found in any of the earlier versions. Mm -hmm. Um, and more importantly, um, Mordred is the product of incest with his half-sister in almost every version of the story. Right. Um, sometimes it's his cousin, but they soften it a little bit. But basically, he's a product of incest. Mm -hmm. And technically a product of sexual assault, too, if Morgan used her spells on Arthur. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Mordred, from a Christian standpoint, literally represents Arthur's sin coming back to kill him. Right. The literal physical embodiment of Arthur's moral weakness returns to destroy him. Mm. Um, the Holy Grail symbolizes being one with God, being purified. Uh, from a Christian standpoint, all of us live in a fallen world. We're all born with original sin because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. But the Holy Grail can take care of that. The Holy Grail can wash away your original sin and make you pure again, which is why everybody sought to find it. Of course, stories being the way they are, the one person that found it was Galahad, who is without sin. <laughs> the number of things, that temptations Galahad turns down in his quest for the grail is hysterically funny. Um, in Spamalot, in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they have a whole convent full of extremely willing young women who want to help the knights on their quest. So they, have to, they have to shun to go hunt for the grail. <laughs> Um, because as a Christian allegory, everything gains extra significance, of course. The dragons that the knights kill are really Satan. The giants that they kill are really pride, that kind of thing. They represent various sins that the knights have to overcome to purify themselves. Right. Um, the Fisher King is a really powerful symbol. The Fisher King is also known as the Wounded King or the Maimed King. Uh, is a potent symbol. Uh, he has been injured. Uh, some people euphemistically say the thigh. But let's just say the Fisher King is injured in a way that he can no longer father children. Mm -hmm. And because he has lost his potency um, and his fertility, the land refuses to yield up any crops. No cattle will live there because the king is wounded, so too the land is wounded. So the relationship between the king and the country that he governs is very implicit in the story of the Fisher King. Right. And that was a big concept in the Middle Ages. If the king came down with a cold, that was bad for everyone who lived in their country. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, when Elizabeth I um, came down with smallpox, um, no one knew about it except her, even her most closest advisors, um, and which was bad because smallpox can leave you scarred for life. Mm -hmm. um, according to most versions of the story, um, she had no facial scars, but she had scars on her hands from the smallpox. So she wore gloves in public for the rest of her life because she could not be seen as having suffering any kind of, of mortal, you know, disease or injury. Now, 
um, Arthur going to Avalon until he's needed again. Mm -hmm. Was there, was it Winston Churchill that there was the parallel drawn? Or, or is that Many people said that Winston Churchill was Arthur reborn. Okay. Your mileage may vary. Um, the idea of the eternal return, that Arthur is still out there somewhere, became an important part of his story. That makes it cyclical, too, that there's really no ending to it. Right. And human nature, I think, is very much drawn to that kind of thing. Yeah. Otherwise, it's too much of a downer. <laughs> um, that, but the cyclical nature of reality is a pagan concept, too, that you wouldn't have found in the Christianized versions of Arthur. That's why, like I said, Malvia's version is Mort de Arthur, he just died. <laughs> I see. Hmm. But it was the legacy that he left behind that's important. Even though it never really happened, people would refer back to Arthur and the way Arthur's knights did things. Throughout all the Middle Ages, even without them ever having been real, it had a profound influence on um, government and relationships in society. Mm -hmm. When we talked about it earlier, um, and when you had specifically mentioned that about it not being real and I hesitated, I was thinking about um, how the story was added to over time and the the bits that were added in some way that was likely hap actually happening to some degree in that time frame. Yes, every person who rewrote it wrote it as if it took place when they were alive. So when we say yeah. it didn't happen, it kind of, it, it didn't, it didn't. It yeah, Malvi's version is set in the high Middle Ages with the huge castles and the extremely heavy plate mail armor because that's what he saw outside his window. Um, Etienne de Troyes' version is set in the early Middle Ages, usually in France. He's the one that came up with Lancelot and all the, the French cycle of knights because uh, that's what he saw outside of his window. I am partial to the idea of it being cyclical and just yeah. adding the experiences because then it's like, well, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if Arthur does come back, he'll definitely come back wiser. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So you're more happy with the legend now? A little bit, yeah. I can't say that it's true, honestly, but um, it's still important. Yes. Um, as heroes, as legendary heroes go, Arthur is the civilizing hero. He's not the monster-slaying hero, although he certainly could and did kill dragons, but that's not what he's famous for. He established a city. He established a nation. He established England. Integrity, honor, yeah. um, for all of that. Those are the virtues that England still tries to harken back to to this day. He's considered the first king of England. So when I said Merlin was trying to create a country, so in a way he did succeed. And I guess that would also be telling of Merlin, if that's what he was trying to create. We we'll never really know. Merlin is a shadowy figure, which is why he's different in so many different interpretations of the story. He's always cunning, and he's always um, keeping his cards close to his <laughs> vest. Is there things that he almost always has in common? Even in versions in which he's not really a magician, in which he's just you know somebody giving advice, he still manipulates people horribly <laughs> for a good cause. Reminds me of uh, Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time, a more recent yeah. TV show. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rumpelstiltskin is also part of the Middle Ages, too. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful right. stories. Yeah, it's a good story. I saw Camelot the Musical when I was a kid. I really loved it. Um, I've been fascinated with King Arthur ever since. Very relatable. Well, one of the reasons why the stories keep being told and retold and other things in the Middle Ages have been forgotten is, um, as one critic pointed out, the King Arthur story is mostly character-driven. You don't find people with strong personalities in fiction written in the Middle Ages. Um, whereas this, the whole story hinges on what Arthur is thinking, what Arthur is feeling, you know, what is, what's going on in Lancelot's head. Everything hinges on the people and the choices that they make, which is why it is so relatable in a way that, you know, Piers Plowman isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to agree. All right, so it's all for now in King Arthur. Okay. So we'll see you next time. Until then, I've been Ed. And Solitaire. See you next time. Till then, be safe.